thank you very much, everyone. Uh, great to be here again after last year. It's bigger and better, and uh, I'm sure that will continue into the future. So I'm going to talk about intangible value. Let's stand somewhere that you can see the screen. And I'll explain what that is. So how much do you think that pen might be worth? Somebody? 50 quid, okay, well, reasonable. Now, what if I told you that that was the pen that had been used to abolish the apartheid law in South Africa? How much is it worth then? Hundreds of thousands, maybe. I mean, who knows? But that one fact, it's the same pen, it's the same ink, it writes the same way, it feels the same, it's the same material object in every way. Uh, but that fact about it multiplies its value by, by hundreds or thousands of times. Uh, here is a Monet painting, uh, or probably a Monet painting, because for many years it was thought to be a fake, and it was sold as a fake at about £40,000. It was valued again, it was examined again, it was authenticated again, and the experts decided that actually, on balance, probably it really is a Monet. Sold again, $4.8 million. Same painting. Same paint is just as beautiful, looks, it provides exactly the same uh, experience, but because you know that it's real, or at least you think on balance that it's real, suddenly it's worth uh, 80 times more. Uh, these uh, trainers, which uh, I was going to wear today, but they had to go in for their MOT, um, might be worth 100 euros if they uh, are just ordinary trainers, but as soon as it's a limited edition, and there are only a thousand of them in the world, then uh, the price is multiplied by five. Same trainers, they feel the same, but you know an extra fact about them, which is that they're scarce, and so they're worth a lot more. And this beer, imagine that uh, on this lovely sunny day, instead of being here, you're out on the beach. There is a beach on the Thames, uh, and uh, you're sitting there sunbathing, the perspiration's rolling off you, and you decide that you'd like to have a beer. Uh, and I offer to go and buy one for you. Well, if I'm going to go to the local corner shop and buy it, or if I'm going to go to the five-star hotel and buy it, I'm still bringing back the same beer. It's going to taste the same. But when you ask people this question, given those two scenarios, people are willing to pay double the amount for the same beer when they think that it's coming from the hotel and not from the local corner shop. So we put a value on things that are intangible, things that we can't touch, that we can't feel, we can't see, but things that we know about a product or about an object. All of these things just in, exist inside your head and inside the head of other people, but they still create value for us. Those examples were from the consumer world, but lots of us here are in business to business. We're selling expertise, we're selling services. Something that is also intangible, a service by definition is intangible before it happens, it doesn't exist yet. We can only value it based on expectations, on reputation, um, but we still put a value on it. And then after it's finished, it also doesn't exist, but it has created some value for us. So a lot of the business to business world is intangible. If uh, you've heard the same content this morning, but uh, from somebody else, would it have had the same value as uh, if it's from the real Brian Massey? Um, I did check that it is the, more or less the real Brian Massey. He doesn't look exactly like this. Um, but it turns out if you search for him on Google, actually this guy comes up as well. Um, and uh, so I'm not sure which of these is the real Brian, but uh, perhaps uh, we'll, we'll find out over some beers later on. Um, and another really important example of intangible value is this. These two pairs of headphones are um, basically the same. The sound quality is the same. One of them apparently has bendy wires, the other has straight wires, but apart from that, they're pretty much identical. But one of them has a brand. And that brand, uh, in some cases, a brand is a promise of higher quality. In this case, those speakers, despite being worth three billion pounds, three billion dollars to Apple, uh, don't have a great reputation for sound quality. Uh, but somehow, it's worth more to us to wear those. And brands in general uh, are extremely valuable. Forbes produces a list of uh, rankings of the top brands in the world, which adds up to something like $1.3 trillion for something that, again, doesn't directly affect the quality or the experience of what you have, but because you know more about the product, you're willing to pay more for it. 
And global advertising spend um, is mostly around building these brands and creating that intangible value so people can sell the same product for more money. Most of those things are intangible aspects of physical products, but there is a growing uh, universe of pure intangible products, and most of us who work in the digital world are creating pure intangibles. What's the, uh, the tweet worth uh, that you read, or the, the hundreds of tweets that you read every day? Uh, what is the software worth that you download? Um, what's your online reputation worth? These are all things that have no physical manifestation at all, but they're worth a fortune. There's a, a huge proportion of the global economy is made up of these intangibles. Um, and to look at how huge um, and how we value them then, um, I've identified five different levels or types of intangible goods. The pure intangibles, things that are only inside our heads and do not have any physical world at all, they're still worth something like $4 trillion. The intangible aspects of physical goods are worth it's harder to say, but five to seven trillion per year in the global economy. The third, goods that are different, but most of us can't tell they're different. So I may pay more money for this Colombian coffee. I know when I go into Starbucks or pret a and they're selling their, uh, their origin uh, blend, then I'll usually be willing to try it and pay more. I can't really tell the difference, but um, I'm willing to pay something for it. And this, uh, back to the paintings again, who thinks the one on the left is the real Jackson Pollock? One person. Who thinks the one on the right is the real Jackson Pollock? Most of you. Okay, well, most of you are wrong because the one on the left is real. The one on the right is hanging in a, a coffee shop somewhere in Washington State uh, and is in the style of Jackson Pollock. But most of us, if we had that poster on our wall, uh, it wouldn't make any difference to us or most of our friends because we can't tell. So there's a... Uh, there's a $4 trillion market for things that, uh, quality markers that most of us can't directly experience. Tangible goods that meet a need that isn't tangible. This is where some of the real money comes from. That car, this is a, a Volvo which famously is sold on safety and everyone feels really safe in, in their Volvo. In reality, of course, the chances of you getting into a crash um, that, where that would make a difference are tiny. But what we really get from buying a Volvo is the feeling of safety, the comfort, the reassurance, or the, the lack of guilt that we might feel strapping our child into the back of a car that we worry whether it's safe or not. These are things that just go on within our head, but we're still willing to pay vast fortunes for them. And then tangible goods that meet tangible needs, but which are based on something intangible deeper. So this glass of wine, which I had at lunchtime today, uh, certainly provided a, a metaphysical need. But it, what it really arose from was the, the stress and terror of getting up in front of you today and uh, the need to assuage that. And this, again, is a, is a huge market. So if you look at the whole world economy, which is about $75 billion, only about 20% of it is physical, real goods. And about 80% of it is goods that are either intangible or in some way arise from needs that are intangible. And to understand why these intangible goods matter and why it is that we want them is fundamental to making money and indeed making people happy in the, in the world economy. Uh, this suit, um, this is actually the suit that I'm wearing half of. I couldn't wear the whole suit because the dress code at all conferences like this requires jeans. But it's made in Bangalore. Uh, the same guy in the same... Uh, in the same studio makes Valentino suits that cost 2,000 pounds. When I bought it, it doesn't have the Valentino label on, so it costs 300. But what is it that adds that 1,700 pounds difference? It's the knowledge among the people you know that you're wearing a, a fancy suit, it's the confidence that it gives you, and all these things are um, non-physical benefits that you get from wearing that suit. Uh, that painting, that money, the value arises from what you think you're going to get when you sell it and from a shared understanding between, uh, if you're in the right circles, between you and the people you know about what that's worth. And the beer, the reason that you're willing to pay more from the hotel than the grocery shop is a perception of fairness. You don't think that it makes sense to pay six euros for a beer from a corner store, even though the same beer you're willing to pay 
a five-star hotel, which probably doesn't need the money as much. So um, one more example is uh, John Voight's car. This is an episode of Seinfeld, where uh, George has bought the car that once belonged to the movie star John Voight, and he's <clears throat> happily driving around town, um, showing off that he's, you know, he's got a bit of the coolness of John Voight by buying this car. Could we play the video, please? So the intangible value of the car destroyed in a single moment there. Um, and uh, we sometimes think that having more information is always good, but in this case, clearly not. And that value comes from the story behind the car, it comes from the memories, it comes from really bragging rights in George's case. <clears throat> so the common link, the world's a complicated place and we need to make sense of it somehow. And we make sense of it with stories. We tell ourselves stories to make the world hang together, to make sense of all the millions of different objects that are in it and to create meaning for them and to help us navigate. And that's what most of these aspects of intangible value are about. Stories give meaning to the things that we choose. Uh, there's a shared language and a shared knowledge and a shared culture among us and the people we know. And these objects help to push particular buttons within those. And the intangible object really exists not, uh, the intangible value not in the object, but in the assumptions around it. So why is this in a psychology conference? Well, the reason that these things happen is because of the limitations within our minds. Our minds are made up of three different aspects that are all in their own way limited. We have a funnel which gathers information in from our senses, from the things we read and the things we hear. And that's limited because we can only take in a certain amount of information. We have a cognitive process that lets us um, work out how that information fits together and what to do with it. And we have calculation limits. We can only think so fast and we can only calculate so many things. And finally, we have the um, ability to translate our present feelings and present needs into the future or into things outside of ourselves. So that's effectively a, a kind of calendar or an ability to, to re make relations between <clears throat> the present <coughs> and the future. And all of these things, uh, we have workarounds in our mind that let us achieve those, um, get past those limitations, but all of those relate to different aspects of intangible value. There are a number of behavioral economics principles that come into this, but I think that we're short of time, so I'm going to skip over those. Um, if Email me afterwards if uh, you'd like a copy of the slides. And the intangible really is about a process for transitioning from objective facts to subjective knowledge and to a shared understanding of the meaning of something. There are five different kinds of intangible goods. Scarcity is one. We saw that with the, uh, um, the limited edition and also the Monet. Authenticity um, related but not the same. So the real Monet is different from the fake Monet even though there's only one of each. 
history or story is the, the, the set of associations and the set of narratives we can tell ourselves about an object, and they stimulate uh, a deeper connection between us and the object that we're holding. Beliefs about what other people think, because what other people think is important to us, both in terms of our own pleasure, our own reputation, and also in terms of how we relate to people and how we uh, manage our economic interactions with them. And finally, beliefs about future value. So we think that this painting is worth something now because we know that people will pay for it in the future. And we expect that the Volvo is worth something to us now because we know just in case something happens in the future, then we'll get some protection from it. These Nike sneakers are a good example. Uh, Nike had a partnership with Kanye West. Uh, they created a limited edition set of 3,000 pairs of, of sneakers. Uh, some of them sold for $90,000. Now, this was not really a money-making uh, scheme because there's a million dollars of revenue there, which on the scale of Nike or indeed Kanye West is not very much. But it's about the brand of, it's about both the brands and how they're enhanced by association with each other. A case study that might be relevant to many people here is a consultancy. Uh, there may be expertise spread widely around your organization. Uh, people may know as much as each other, but some people are going to be more highly valued if they have symbols attached to that knowledge. So it might be the person that's written the book, the person that was interviewed on the BBC, the person that consulted for a famous brand or a famous person. And symbols are easier to measure and to uh, use than uh, real expertise because it's very hard for us to evaluate anybody's real expertise. Um, and in this particular case study, there's a, a method that the company followed to boost the intangible value associated with its people and uh, allow them to earn higher rates. So all these things are happening inside our head. Why then do we need the external object to bring the value? Why can't we just change our minds and tell ourselves, well, you know, that thing that I cared about, I don't really care about the, uh, the limited edition anymore. Um, or I care about something else that I've already got. Well, our minds are designed to not to let us do that. Our minds have evolved so that we can't actually just decide on our own preferences or choose the things that we want. Um, if we could, I mean, there was a a scheme, a proposal a couple of years ago for Arsenal fans to get together and the, let's say there's a million Arsenal fans and we all put in 200 pounds each, we'd be able to buy some decent players. Um, well, why don't all the Arsenal fans just go and get, go to a hypnotist and get persuaded to follow Man, Man City instead? Somehow that doesn't seem very authentic. It, it would allow us to support the team that wins the league, but our minds don't, don't let us just change our own preferences in that way. So we have to use external tools instead. And those external tools can be physical or they can be informational tools. But those are the things that let us change what we want, change what we care about. If we read a book or watch a film, we, we play a game with ourselves that we care enough about the characters so that we're happy when they're happy. We, we have something at stake, um, but we're not too devastated if they die at the end. Spoiler alert. And basically, we, we use these intangible pieces of information and pieces of knowledge um, to provide what's missing in our minds and to make ourselves happy, to get past those psychological limitations. And that game that we play with ourselves is, uh, is really how we enjoy life. So this is a, a, an issue or a, a sector of the economy that's growing in importance. Everyone wants meaning and purpose and, and a narrative for their lives. And intangible value can create that. And if you're a company that can offer it, then you can create that for them. It provides a connection between people. We can link ourselves together through symbolic things. Uh, we can find common things to care about. And uh, we can share things, share meaning with each other through the intangible. And it really is the future of the economy. Once our basic material needs are met, which we're lucky enough in, in the richer countries to, to have done and is starting to be more and more the case in other places, then everything else is about the intangible and is about the softer things that give us meaning. And really, the, uh, even if you think that uh, selling someone a pair of sneakers for three times the price, um, which makes it worth, supposedly, to that person what three pairs of sneakers would have been worth. If you think that's a bit of a trick and somehow it's, 
it's a bit dishonest. Well, isn't it better for the world than manufacturing the three pairs of sneakers and selling them? And the more that the economy of the world comes to rely and be based on intangible information goods and things that don't consume real resources, then the more chance we have of surviving the next thousand years. Thank you very much. It's a unique way of becoming green. Do we have <laughs> um, questions for Lee? If we do, thrust your hand in the air. I'm watching the darkness. If not, I have a, a question. As somebody who um, is essentially in a completely intangible business selling online software services where there is no physical thing that, that mm. transacts at all. And what, what is the kind of the primary difference in perceived value? Because I'm very aware for our, for our customers, it's a, mm. it's a really big step. They're giving us money and we give them nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, often in those cases, I recommend that you actually create a tangible symbol of it. So maybe just send them something. Uh, it doesn't need to be, a CD would kind of probably put you a bit back in the, in the dark ages, but maybe send them some even merchandise or something physical so that they can make the connection. And that's about um, where I said that we use stories to um, create a richer connection with the physical objects that we have. The reverse is true as well. We can use physical objects to remind ourselves of the intangible things that we possess. So it could be something just like a key ring or a t-shirt. Um, maybe something more original. I'm, uh, I'm sure we could come up with some ideas, but uh, something physical can um, just make things feel a little bit more real and, and provide a reminder so that the, the intangible value of what you've given them um, comes into their head more often and, uh, and therefore is, is multiplied within their, their perception. Thank you very much. Even in the digital world, physical things are still very important. Thank you very, very much. All right. Thank you.